So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Leah Harris. I am a student at the Macaulay Honors College. And today I will be presenting my project titled Food as Medicine, Integrating the Science of Nutrition into Healthcare. And I decided upon this topic because of my interest in both medicine and nutrition. As an aspiring physician, I hope to one day not only use conventional medicine, but also nutrition in order to help patients heal the underlying causes of their disease rather than just managing their symptoms. Today um, in the US, 60% of adults have one or more preventable chronic diet-related disease. Some common diet-related diseases include obesity, cardiovascular diseases, and type 2 diabetes. To illustrate the severity of this issue, let's look at some more statistics. Over 70% of adults are overweight or have obesity. About 50% of adults have a cardiovascular disease, and about 10% of Americans have diabetes. Currently the, leading risk, currently, the leading risk factor for death is a poor diet. It seems intuitive that physicians should be striving to address the primary cause of diet-related diseases, that is nutrition. Yet, as physicians continue to focus on solving individual symptoms rather than the root causes of disease, the use of treatments like medication and surgery often overshadow dietary interventions. As the epidemic of chronic diet-related diseases continues to worsen, nutrition must be merged more tightly into healthcare. I argue that physicians should embrace nutrition as a form of prevention and treatment for diet-related diseases. My project also explores how nutrition can be optimally integrated into healthcare. To support my argument, I have analyzed the scientific literature regarding the impact of diet on human health and medical case studies of patients who have been treated with nutrition to manage or reverse their diseases. Additionally, I've interviewed four New York City physicians, both MDs and DOs across different specialties to learn about their opinions on using nutrition in healthcare. Listed here are the physicians and their respective specialties, and you will hear me refer to a few of them throughout this presentation. I will be delving into the following topics, barriers to using nutrition in healthcare, why physicians should use nutrition in clinical practice, and how to integrate nutrition into healthcare. So physicians only offer nutrition counseling in 20% of encounters with patients at risk for diet-related diseases. And this lack of nutrition counseling stems from the presence of numerous barriers that prevent physicians from using nutrition in their practices. These barriers include a lack of nutrition education and medical training, the sensitive nature of weight-centered conversations, time pressures imposed for insurance reimbursements, the medicalization of obesity, and the practice of reductionism in modern medicine. Um, but for the sake of time, I will only be discussing those two barriers. So as I said, the lack of medical training is one notable barrier. When I asked physicians how much nutrition education they received in medical school, they all answered very little. And their responses are supported by a study that reports 71% of medical schools do not meet the recommended 25 hours of nutrition education. 36% of medical schools provide less than 12 and a half hours of nutrition education. And only 14% of physicians feel adequately trained to facilitate discussions on nutrition. The deficiency of education during medical school has led to low confidence and in turn increased hesitancy to discuss nutrition with patients. The sensitive nature of our conversations is another huge hurdle that prevents physicians from using nutrition. If physicians want to offer guidance about nutrition, the conversation may naturally touch upon weight, which is a topic that many patients oftentimes don't want to discuss as it can elicit feelings of guilt, shame, and failure. Dr. Nestler said, many doctors sugarcoat their concern or don't spend as much time on the topic as they should out of fear of hurting the patient's feelings. Thus, the challenges of navigating patient um, navigating weight-centered conversations with patients often limit the opportunities for physicians to educate them about nutrition. 
So if we can find ways to overcome these barriers, physicians should aim to use nutrition in clinical practice because of its potential to prevent, treat, and reverse diet-related diseases as revealed by the scientific literature and medical case studies. Moreover, nutrition can be used to improve other health conditions as well, and it is highly cost-effective. The ability of nutrition to prevent disease is arguably its greatest strength. One study followed over 3,200 individuals at high risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Participants were given one of three treatments. That was a placebo, metformin, which is a drug used to prevent diabetes, or lifestyle modifications, which included dietary changes. When researchers followed up with participants about three years later, they found that those who adhered to lifestyle modifications reduced their incidence of diabetes by 58%, while well, those given metformin reduced the incidence by 31% compared to placebo. And you can see this on the graph, um, highlighted in green is the lifestyle modification group. And so researchers concluded lifestyle modifications were significantly more effective than metformin at preventing the incidence of type two diabetes. In a follow-up study, Later, the researchers found that those in the lifestyle modification group still maintain the lowest cumulative incidence of diabetes compared to both metformin and the placebo groups. So this is just one of many studies um, that emphasize how nutrition is an effective clinical tool to prevent the onset of diet-related diseases. Nutritional interventions not only prevent, but they can also treat and reverse diseases. Dr. Esselstein, a renowned cardiologist, shared a case study of a 44-year-old man with heart disease and high cholesterol who was treated with a plant-based diet without the use of medication. Shown here is an image of the patient's coronary artery before and after adhering to the diet. So as you can see in A, this is illustrating his diseased artery before treatment. A fatty material called plaque was built up in his artery as shown by the darker region, indicating minimal blood flow to his heart. And then in B, um, this is illustrating his artery after adhering to the plant-based diet. And you can see that there's an increase in the light area, indicating that the amount of plaque has regressed, normal blood flow was restored, and thus his heart disease was reversed in just 32 months. Um, scientific literature supports individual case studies like this one which highlight how nutritional interventions tackle the root causes of disease, allowing it to both halt disease progression and then reverse the state of disease in patients. In addition to um, treating diet-related diseases, the applications of nutrition are far-reaching as it can be used to improve other health conditions as well. Dr. Rosenthal says that she prescribes food as medicine to help um, her patients manage various pain concerns. By guiding her patients through a plant-based diet treatment plan, their pain is controlled, inflammation is reduced, injuries are prevented, um, and medications are no longer needed. She advocates for lifestyle medicine, which includes using nutrition as the most responsible and ethical way to treat patients. Moreover, nutrition is incredibly cost-effective as a treatment. Researchers predicted that if Medicare and Medicaid offered a healthy food incentive to its beneficiaries, over their lifetime, it would increase healthy food consumption, prevent about 3.3 million um, cardiovascular disease events, prevent over 120,000 cases of diabetes, and save an astonishing $100.2 billion in healthcare costs. And so these findings underscore how nutrition can prevent diet-related diseases while also dramatically reducing healthcare costs. In order for physicians to embrace nutrition as a form of prevention and treatment, nutrition must first be fully integrated into healthcare. And there are several methods by which this can be done. Um, and the most immediate way is to improve the medical education to sufficiently teach nutrition, ensuring proficiency in nutrition concepts. Northwestern universities find School of Medicine is one of few schools that has revised their curriculum to now teach nutrition longitudinally throughout the four years of medical school. And you can see the difference between um, the traditional and the revised curriculum shown on the slide. 
There also must be greater collaboration between healthcare providers and nutrition experts. So physicians, nurses, physician assistants, and others need to work closely with dietitians and nutritionists. And then patients will be more likely to receive satisfactory nutrition counseling, allowing for better prevention and treatment of diet-related diseases. Medical centers should also be establishing more initiatives that encourage patients to make healthier food choices and educate them on the importance of nutrition. Dr. Godwin Gorga suggests that when informing patients about healthy eating habits, educators should be mindful that food is cultural. Educators should demonstrate how aspects of a healthy diet can be adapted to any ethnic cuisine. By doing so, patients will understand that eating healthy does not need to compromise cultural fears which may motivate them to not just passively learn, but also actively apply these lessons to their own diet. Finally, if we want to successfully bridge the gap between nutrition and healthcare, we must also fix the toxic food environment, which currently promotes the consumption of unhealthy foods, especially in low income and minority communities. The solution to this requires a combination of efforts, such as increasing access to healthy foods, lowering the cost of healthy foods, tackling dangerous food marketing tactics, establishing better standards for school lunches, and increasing farm subsidies to produce more fruits and vegetables. All in all, if we want to decrease the prevalence of chronic diet-related diseases, physicians must embrace nutrition as a form of prevention and treatment. By integrating nutrition and healthcare through the methods that I described, we can create a new generation of physicians who will be equipped to address nutrition and promote the long-term health of patients. Thank you. And I just wanted to give a special thank you to my professors, Reese and McBride, for their support and guidance on this project. And uh, we can open it up for questions, either from the chat or um, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I have a question. Um, what were your, um, based on the topic of your, like, um, based on the topic you were discussing, like, what are your thoughts on, like, Michelle, Michelle Obama's, like, um, push for, like, school lunch being healthier? Yeah, um, I think that's great. Um, that, so... Obviously, I'm arguing that physicians should be using nutrition, but in addition to that, there also needs to be these societal changes. So like I mentioned, we need better standards for school lunches. Um, so any kind of initiatives that are also trying to change the food environment, educate children, um, and make healthy food more accessible is going to be part of the solution of helping to prevent this huge issue of chronic diet-related diseases. We'll have a few minutes at the end as well. So our uh, our next speaker can uh, can go ahead now, and that is Kendall. Okay. Can anyone see the presentation? So my presentation title is OMG: The GMOs and the knowledge gap between the general public and the academics the consensus. By the way, my name is Kenner Koo. I am a, a senior at CCNY at the Macaulay Honors Program. And so um, for a show of hands, um, um, oh, if you went grocery shopping and you, you're familiar with these products, like what is one common thing you see between these products shown here? Uh, yes, Leo? Um, they all have the non-GMO um, tag. Oh, yes. That's exactly what I was looking for. So basically, um, the non-GMO um, project is basically like a, a label or a, a regulatory body, a third, a third party regulatory body that um, goes through like um, steps and like um, procedures in which companies go through to check if their foods are non-GMO. And so this is like some people's first experience with like the term GMO. They see that most, most of these products have the non-GMO um, label 
but they don't they don't know if it's good or bad unless they associate it with oh if this is next to like other labels such as like all natural or like sustainable like it must be good for the environment or like for your daily consumption right and so my thesis is um for the topic at hand is there is a clear divide between the general the public consensus and the academic experts regarding food labels and the sciences behind them, such as the term GML, despite the evidence being settled. This divide can be attributed to both the large quantity of both misinformation um, present on the internet from several contributors to the lack of scientific literacy due to systemic problems within society. By ultimately addressing these broader issues, will the gap not just decrease for the discussion of GMOs, but close other rifts for separate fields of science, such as in today's world where we, where skeptics talk about vaccine efficacy and safety during the COVID-19 pandemic or um, climate change denialism during the topic of climate change. Like um, for this topic, it might, uh, it will extend to other scientific discussions. And so to lay out the whole presentation, we're gonna be discussing what are GMOs um, what are what is the scientific consensus of GMOs? How much the public agrees with the scientists on the consensus of GMOs? And if there is a large disagreement, what might be the reasons for that? And if there's any solutions to close the gap between the public and the scientists? So GMOs. The term GMOs is an abbreviation for genetically modified organisms. This is when living things or specifically food crops in this context are given a gene to an array of benefits. So mostly it's given a gene, but it can be subtracted or it can be manipulated. But the benefits for GMOs um, by the scientists would include being drought resistance in an environment where droughts are um, common and the land is arid. And with, with there being a drought, there might be less food for the general human population in that area more yield as the human population is increasing, um, more yield is a, is a particularly favorable benefit. So to feed a large growing population. An insect repellent, there's like been, there is controversies for like using pesticides in food and if it affects um, human consumption and like human health. And so if you manipulate the crop itself to be insect repellent, you wouldn't be using these pesticides that might have, um, negative consequences. And compared to GMOs um, are conventional foods that um, we artificially select. So artificial selection is when we crossbreed like two crops that we grow naturally. Um, and then we crossbreed them to have, um, to get benefits from them. Such as like if two, two of the best crops that we have are like have more yield, we can just crossbreed them and generally their offspring will generally have more yield. Compared to GMOs, um, it takes longer to implement and it takes time, trials and tribulations to do it. Whereas GMO, you can edit the gene and the next generation will have the, the said benefits. And if there's a problem, um, usually we could just uh, rework back to, back to the present generation. Whereas in artificial selection, since it takes so much time, we might like lose the original like seed or like original generation for that. So this is why some people suggest why GMOs are being more beneficial compared to conventional foods. So what is the scientific consensus? Well, for scientific consensus, um, what I aim to look at is um, what organizations and um, bodies of physicians, doctors, and other scientists related to the health field um, talk about GMOs. Um, one of these organizations is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In a Pew Research article, 88% of the AAAS scientists are in agreement that GMOs are safe for consumption. Um, co um, consensus, scientific consensus can be um, formed through scientists um, um, having like credentials and also like papers that are related to the field. And so we don't have just scientific consensus, but also meta-analyses. And a meta-analysis is basically a summary of all the papers and the results to see what common results come out 
And the common results on the literature of GMOs is that it is commonly safe for, for human consumption. And so this is very favorable because um, this is better than like a cherry picked like paper from a, a very um, mini minuscule journal that many like skeptics and other like conspiracy theorists use that are like not in line with like the mainstream like thought. So what is the general con public consensus on this? Well, 50% of, of them disagree with the scientists. They believe that GMOs are unsafe to eat compared to the scientific consensus and to compare to other types of consensus. So only 43%, so if 57% disagree, that means only 43% agree with the scientists or they have no opinion at all. Compared to other topics such as climate change, 55% are with the scientists. And for vaccinations, um, as of now, 66% um, of the United States is fully vaccinated for COVID. So this is a starker contrast compared to the, both the, the topic of climate change and vaccine and, and vaccines, even though this is like a less publicized, politicized and less talked about subject compared to those um, um, issues as of today in the political climate. So to explain this large gap in consensus, I've talked about three common um, factors as to why. Um, one of them is the spread of misinformation. The other is misplaced blame towards an, the economic system as opposed to just the technology itself. And three is the lack of scientific communication in dealing with topics of science and whether and how scientists can communicate towards the general public. So misinformation, we all hear this in discussions and like politi political discussions in particular. Um, what I categorize as misinformation is knowledge based on inaccurate information or a false interpretation of the data. And so this also includes like clickbait articles that have an outrageous title for people to click. And, it, and when it, on the topic of GMOs, it mostly appeal, it mostly relies on appeals to nature fallacies. So this fallacy states that anything natural must be good for you, while anything human made is uncalled for and goes against people's notions of mother nature. And this is to say that um, um, clickbait articles are just easier to like share compared to like scientific papers, because papers are mostly filled with like scientific jargon, but with articles, um, um, simplicity is the most appealing part of why people share them. Lots of things that are allowed in, there's a lot of things that are allowed in articles um, that, are, that are probably not acceptable in uh, publications of scientific papers. Um, two is the unfiltered access to all information on the internet, which can be factual or false. People can say like, you can find anything on the internet, which is true, but they only assume like the facts and the truth versus like people can maliciously or ignorantly like spread false information based on their own knowledge and how easy it is to like make your own website, make your own blog post and to even like make your own YouTube video that goes viral based on um, false information that doesn't need to be vetted for you know, scientific validity. So anyone can make articles or invent talking points. If you go on YouTube and watch someone you like with good rhetoric, but not enough background and knowledge on the topic for example, on YouTube, like the algorithm will lead you to other similarly opinionated channels and videos that you started with instead of the ones with like scientific background. And all, all feeds to a pipeline where you just regurgitate the similar information based on an echo chamber that YouTube fed you. And another type of echo chamber that might lead you to just continue believing in misinformation would be like closed group chats that, call, um, that cause an echo chamber of thought. So group chat can, sizes can range from thousands of people that joined to find anonymous strangers with a shared commonality, or it can be limited to people's extended families with a messaging app. So say like WhatsApp or like iMessage with your family, but for like bigger, larger groups, it would be like Facebook groups. So that's one factor for why the, the gap between the scientific consensus and the general public is that big. The second one would be the misplaced blame on an economic system and other 
corporations versus the technology itself. Often associated target alongside GMOs is the corporation Monsanto's. Monsanto's is a bio, biotechnolo biotechnology company that has patented GM seeds, genetically modified seeds. And patented seeds are a problem for both small farmers and the environment because um, due to like the patent restrictions and laws, if a small farmer is caught with a patented seed that is accidentally found in their field because, you know, weather conditions such as, you know, strong winds and stuff like that. If, if regulators from the US government check that they do have these um, patented seeds that they've grown, Monsanto usually sues these smaller um, farmers and as a settlement bankrupts them as so they so Monsanto becomes like the bigger like competitor in the market. And it's also bad for the environment because patented seeds, while they're studied for their benefits for human consumption, there's less study for their environmental impact. And it could be considered an invasive species if these patented seeds like outgrow like most of the wildlife in areas where where um, um where genetically modified um crops might um over over represent themselves. So in my, for this reason, I would say the fault lies in the lack of regulations on corporations using technology. And that technology by itself is not inherently evil. Just the corporations that use, for example, patent laws to like target small farmers is, is the bigger blame for this. Last would be more information on like closed chat rooms and group chats. So I listed other examples in the past, but it also other examples include Discord servers. And this is bad because um, it, it makes an ecosystem that is conducive to the same opinions and shared think pieces. And also enforces more extreme beliefs and becomes a pipeline to others. An example in the political climate would be anti-vaxxers entering the QAnon um, conspiracy theory during the pandemic. And now it might seem grim and dim that this gap in knowledge is that drastic, but I have, you know, I have some um, solutions for this that might help. Um, one would be an increase in the number of scientific communicators on social media. So previously in the past, I don't know if anyone remembers Bill Nye the Science Guy. Um, it was a famous show that tries to educate kids on like science and like science in general. And I think we need more of that. Um, not just like in like TV shows and like or streaming services like Netflix, but also like on YouTube or like other free platforms so that kids get more exposure to the science versus like people without a scientific background. Two would be offer like specifically scientific literacy classes in schools. So most of the time scientific literacy is like added as like a small detail in like just general science classes. But I think there should be a fully dedicated classes on this because just as like in like journalism, we should, um, people should be trained to like learn how to read, how to navigate through the information, how to perceive bias, how to check fact, um, check your sources. But in terms of scientific literacy, it would be like check the methodology of the paper, check if the sample size is enough, et cetera, et cetera. Three would be to pressure social media platforms to stop, this, to stop the spread of misinformation. So as of now, like Twitter and like YouTube are, are ones they put like banners um, or like, I think I know in the case of YouTube, they put like links of Wikipedia pages to like scientific um, topics like climate change. So there's the, if there's the words climate change in the video title, there's there's gonna be a link of uh, the climate change um, Wikipedia page for it under in the YouTube. And for Twitter, um, if it's like egregious like misinformation, um, they'll, they'll have a disclaimer under the tweet that says like, oh, this might be a violation of terms of service based on it spreading misinformation. So social media platforms are going, are trying, but I think we should do more due to the amount of, of negative consequences that result from misinformation. And that's it for the presentation. And I hope you spread the word on um, GMOs in general. Thank you. Yes, um, I guess Leah has a question. 
Um, I was wondering if you found, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, if that in any way increased um, GMO controversy because of this increase in mistrust of science. Yeah, I did, um, I did find a link on like how there's like a pipeline if people are anti-vaxxers, they'll get lead into a pipeline of like people who are like against like any like human like um, science and technology. And it'll be, you'll be like, like in group chats and crowds that are just anti-GMOs as well, anti-climate change, for example. So all leads to like a pipeline to these sorts of groups based on the underlying assumption that like, like the appeal to nature fallacy. Yes, Bea has a question. So I was just wondering if in your research you found whether or not any of those non-GMO um, products compared to the GMOs, like do they make a difference in terms of like nutritional value or things of the like, or is it more just um, like marketing and labeling and misinformation? Yeah, I checked one of the papers on it. There's no difference in nutrition. I find it's more of a marketing ploy based on um, companies saying like, oh, like if you use terms such as all natural or like sustainable or green, like it'll get more consumers thinking that it's healthier for you. And that's not really the case. And if, and if there's regulation that says you have to say it's GMO, then it will be bad for as in, in, in a marketing standpoint because consumers don't know what that is and therefore they will be scared of what that is to begin with. Um, and last but not least, our, our final speaker for this session, Bia. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, let me turn. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Bea Tolentino, and I'm a student at Macaulay Honors College at Hunter College. Today, I'm going to be presenting my research, Dirty Beauty, examining the truth behind the effects of clean beauty products on personal health. So in this project specifically, um, it stemmed from a love of both makeup and an interest in healthcare. And my thesis explores this intersection between the two in an attempt to better understand how health and beauty align, especially in terms of the clean beauty movement, which has risen rapidly in the past decade or so. So my research, specifically it tries to answer these two questions. What is clean beauty and what effect does clean beauty have on personal health? So for this presentation, I have cut down some of my research um, in the overall paper. I delve deeper into regulation, history, and individual ingredient investigations. But due to time restraints, I'm going to be presenting just one ingredient investigation today and really highlighting why and how the clean beauty movement has risen to the status it holds today. So this presentation is going to be broken down into four main categories. First is beauty interview, which is a brief review of several milestones in cosmetics and clean beauty. Next, we're going to look at both international and domestic regulation of cosmetics, um, followed by how clean beauty has risen in the past decade or so. And lastly, an ingredient investigation on talc, which is one of the ingredients that is often um, banned in clean beauty companies and clean beauty ingredients. Um, products. So first, beauty in review. Let's look at a brief timeline of clean beauty. We start in 1938 with the passing of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act by the FDA. So this is the first instance of cosmetic regulation that we see in the United States. We fast forward to 2010 with the appearance of the first detox market pop up in California. This is the introduction of uh, Clean beauty as the modern movement that we see today. In 2018, we see that it's made its move into a more mainstream uh, cosmetic consumer market with the launching of Clean at Sephora uh, in 2019. I don't have the picture here, but in 2019, we also have Ulta following in pursuit with Conscious Beauty at Ulta. And by 2020, we can see that clean beauty has really created 
a name for itself and become a household staple as it even gets inaugurated with a National Coon Beauty Day in the United States, which is on July 15th. So before regulation, um, prior to 1938, there was little to no regulation of cosmetics at all on the market. So um, companies were able to market cosmetics in any way they deemed fit and did not really have to disclose any of the in ingredients they used. So on the left, I have pictured Lash Lure, which was an eyelash and brow dye. It was marketed as a more long lasting alternative to the conventional eyebrow um, pencils and mascara. Unfortunately, it contained aniline dye, which was highly irritating. It caused hair loss of the eyebrows and the eyelashes, as well as in vision impairment and in some cases, even blindness. On the right, I have pictured Ophine, which is a skin lightener marketed to create a flawless complexion for um, users who use the product. It had mercury in it, which is a known neurological um, toxin. So it caused uh, bone loss, tooth deterioration, uh, neurological, pulmonary, and renal damage, cognitive and sensory impairment, and in some cases, even death. So we can see that prior to this regulation, there's a clear uh, correlation between these cosmetics and ill personal health. So now let's take a look at domestic regulation. So under the Food, Drugs, and Cosmetics Act of 1938, the FDA banned use of 11 ingredients in cosmetics. So currently the FDA still operates under the same act being 1938 Cosmetic Act. Um, and we don't really see a change in terms of what they're banning and how they're regulating it. Most of the authority of the FDA lies in the marketing and labeling of these products rather than um, actually what goes into them. So they take a very passive role in just ensuring that labels accurately depict what is in a product, but not really going into investigation of whether or not what um, those ingredients are is really uh, healthy or toxic uh, and things of the like. So there are several ingredients here. We have at the top, all carcinogenic ingredients, biphenyl, chloroform, ethylene chloride, vinyl chloride, and zirconium containing compounds. At the bottom left-hand corner, the three ingredients listed there are skin irritants. We have chlorofluorocarbon propellants, which are banned for their uh, damage to the environment. Cattle materials are banned for their potential to cause mad cow disease or bovine disease. And sunscreen, interestingly, is banned because its use in cosmetics then switch the product from a cosmetic to a drug. So then it's under drug regulation. Unfortunately, these products still have certain caveats to them, so they can still be used in cosmetics given um, the right conditions. For example, mercury compounds can still be used in really low concentrations, uh, 65 parts per million in eye area products. And chloroform can be used in very, very small concentrations as well as solvent uh, for cosmetics. So while these are banned, they're not completely set in stone in terms of being completely absent from cosmetic products. In comparison to international regulation, we see strictly quantitatively that uh, regions like Canada, South Korea, and Europe have more ingredients banned, as well as cosmetic regulations that have been more recently updated and therefore are more um, accurately able to define what cosmetics should be regulated in accordance to new technologies and new developments in cosmetics. These uh, institutions also take on a more active role in comparison to the FDA, with uh, inspectors being promoted in Health Canada's cosmetic regulations. So they are able to regulate the import of products into Canada. They do investigations into these products. In Korea, they have two uh, set associations that actually conduct product risk assessments on all the products that go onto the market. And in the European Commission, they have allocated responsible parties for each product. Um, and they are to report any adverse side effects to the European Commission in the event that there are any. And this is all compiled into a database that then gets released to the general public for um, information. So based off of these, we see why there is a gap 
in terms of where cosmetics are in the United States, which has really given rise to why clean beauty has uh, gained traction and made a name for itself. So we see the rise of clean beauty first with uh, Karen Banke, Romain Gaillard, and Rosemary Swift, who are pioneers in the clean beauty movement starting in 2005. So interestingly, all of these founders of clean beauty companies were, inspir were inspired by health-related concerns. Rosemary Swift was a makeup artist who was constantly exposed to the chemicals in cosmetics, which caused uh, several illnesses for her. Romain Gaillard had a friend with breast cancer, and that's what inspired him to really look into alternatives for uh, healthier products for personal care, and Karen Benke was looked for those products as well during her pregnancy. In modern times, we have seen the inclusion of clean beauty in the mainstream market, especially propagated by influencers. So while in the past, it was a lot of celebrity endorsement like Goop by Gwyneth Paltrow or Honest Beauty by Jessica Alba um, that created this clean beauty kind of momentum in the general public, we see influencers taking that role today, especially as they create a much more uh, approachable uh, demeanor in terms of presenting clean beauty to the mainstream market. So here I have pictured Hiram Yarbo, who is one of the skin influencers who really gained traction, especially during the pandemic with his TikToks and YouTube channel. So um, we see through these influencers that the mainstream market is really getting into the clean beauty movement and becoming more aware of it. We also see that mainstream market influence in terms of companies like Ulta and Sephora creating their own clean beauty initiatives with Clean at Sephora and Conscious Beauty at Ulta, as I stated previously. And in all of this with the companies, influencers, and uh, mega makeup conglomerates, there is no set definition for what clean is. So each company is still able to market and brand clean beauty in a way that best suits them. Um, and there's no set regulation or standard in terms of what they have to do for that. So now we do an ingredient investigation looking specifically at talc. So I have pictured Johnson's baby powder and Laura Mercier's loose translucent powder. So while Johnson's baby powder is not a cosmetic product, uh, it recently gained some hot water in terms of its use of talc. So Johnson's baby powder contains only two ingredients, fragrance and talc. And in 2019, they had a multi-million dollar lawsuit uh, filed against them for the use of talc in their baby powder because it contained asbestos. So asbestos is a known carcinogen. And for a product that you would assume to be related to babies who should have the safest products of all, it caused great concern with um, this carcinogenic asbestos contamination. So uh, this line was actually discontinued and it's no longer on the market. And in clean beauty, that talc ingredient is often replaced with zayamase or cornstarch. So cosmetically treated zayamase or cornstarch um, as it's deemed safe by the Cosmetic Ingredient Review Expert Panel, causing minimal skin irritation. Uh, unfortunately, one of the concerns with the use of cornstarch in cosmetics is that it can propagate some misinformation to the mainstream consumer market. So while uh, cosmetic cornstarch is treated with preservatives, regular food grade cornstarch is not. And some people see cornstarch on their makeup labels and think it'll be the same as just getting cornstarch off of their grocery store shelves. And unfortunately, this can cause greater skin irritation and damage as that food grade cornstarch does not contain those preservatives and therefore can foster uh, bacteria growing colonies and fungus. So now we return to those two main questions. What is clean beauty and what effect does clean beauty have on personal health? So while the true definitions of clean beauty remained undefined, the question of its effect on personal health remains. So through this investigation of domestic and international regulation, social media and retail influence, and ingredient makeup, it's clear that the most hazardous ingredient in clean beauty is misinformation. 
it's only when cosmetics and clean beauty are able to be defined clearly and set to a universal standard that they can truly make a difference in the lives of cosmetic consumers and create a perfect union between beauty and health. Finally, surpassing the age old adage of pain is beauty and turning it into health is beauty. Thank you all for your time. Um, and I'll take any questions now. Yes, Leah. Um, so you mentioned that companies have their own regulations on what is clean and what is not. Um, and I know, like you mentioned at Sephora, they have the clean beauty labels. And so as a consumer, I would assume that the labels that are, uh, the products that are labeled clean would be better than those that are not. Um, but if they don't have any like regulations and they can um, say what they think is clean, how would consumers know like what is good and what is not is there any way besides like reading all the ingredients and like yeah is there any like easier way for consumers to know right now a lot of retailers do adhere to a relatively there are like a few ingredients that are universally condemned as bad some of them would be talc petroleum fragrance um, sulfates, parabens, things of the like. So universally across um, most clean beauty companies, you will see ingredients like those. But um, in terms of really knowing what's clean or what's better for you and what's not as a consumer, um, since there's no universal standard to it and it's not really regulated in the United States by an authority, um, it's all at your own discretion basically, which is why there's a need for this universal standard. So it's not at the consumer's risk to be using these products. Hi there, thanks for your, thanks for your interesting talk. Um, have you come across this uh, brand called, the Clean Beauty brand, BC Counter? The advocacy Clean Beauty brand, I think it's great. I'm so sorry, could you repeat that? I couldn't really hear. Have you come across a, brand, a clean beauty brand called Beauty Counter? Yes, so um, Beauty Counter is actually one of the first companies that I investigated. Um, it was, I initially found it as something very interesting because they banned 1800 ingredients um, in their products, which is even more than the European Commission does. So I was like, oh my goodness, this must be this great company. Um, doing further investigation into it though, I decided not to proceed with using Beauty Counter as the sole um, example of what clean beauty should be in my research, mainly because I discovered that part of its marketing scheme is kind of like a pyramid um, scheme. So I wasn't sure in that case how efficient their marketing would be as clean um, if they were trying to market this pyramid type marketing scheme. So they would be trying to appeal to a consumer more um, in that case. So I shifted my focus from that brand and generalized it more to individual ingredients. Any other questions? So um, thank you to everyone, um, and particularly to Leah and Henrik and Bea, who did a fantastic job. And thank you so much for sharing your research with us this morning. Um, congratulations on outstanding presentations. And thanks to our, um, our participants as well. We were happy to have you in the room with us this morning. And I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Take care, everyone. Thank you. You too.